As a part of this series, friends, um, we've been inviting folks who are already doing this good work of rewilding in our communities to come and share a little bit about what that work looks like. And uh, one of those places here in the community is Piedmont Farm Animal Refuge. Um, and so we've invited uh, Lenore, Sorry, I had Lori and now Lenore. Lenore Brayford to come. Who Lenore, uh, Lenore is the director, the founder, just the one who does all of the things, wears all the hats at Piedmont Farm Animal Refuge. And, uh, and, and this is a place where that good work of mending and healing in community happens. Um, and so please, Lenore, come and share with us this morning. Hello, everybody. My name is Lenore Brayford, and I'm the founder and executive director at Piedmont Farm Animal Refuge, or The Refuge, as we call it for short. Um, and we are located uh, here in Pittsburgh. So we, if you know the area, are on 87 North in between Chicken Bridge Road and Castle Rock. And we're on 45 acres of land. Um, and we have been founded since 2012, so we've been around for about 12 years, and over that time, we've been growing and taking in more and more animals in need. And we currently care for over 100 farm animals who have been rescued from abuse, neglect, and abandonment, and those include sheep and goats, chickens and turkeys, ducks and geese, cows, and one guinea fowl named Miss Frizzle. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, in addition to rescuing them, we also invite people to come to the refuge to meet these animals and learn about them. And we do that through tours, through school field trips, and other events. Um, and in addition to caring for these animals, uh, we provide veterinary medical care for them, which is our biggest expense. Uh, many of these animals are coming from situations where they were previously mistreated, but also we provide lifelong care. Uh, so that means that just like you or I, over the time of their life, they may have different illnesses and sicknesses that we have to treat. So whether it's giving regular hoof trims or dealing with other issues, um, we're making sure that they have the happiest life possible. And connecting with um, these animals is really important. Um, I think, can you go back one slide? Oh, we might be out of order, that's okay. I'm looking for the one with the, with the duck house. <laughs> There we go, thank you. Um, one thing I have to mention um, is that my husband Paul is an architect and one of the things that we do at our refuge because of his influence is to try to build habitats for them that are very in line with um, what they would want. So uh, he considers, you know, for example, ducks as a client. <laughs> and you know, if a duck could build their own house, what would it look like and why? <laughs> and so uh, we call that animal-centered design and just trying to put ourselves in the shoes of others and we can't communicate with them or ask them, but we can learn and then we can build for them and then we can observe and see how they utilize those spaces. So you can see for the duck habitat, the pond is central and it includes this cantilevered porch where they uh, start their morning every day by coming out of the little duck doors and leaping off of the dock into the water, uh, which they seem to enjoy. So we, we take notes about that. <laughs> Yes, you can pass that one. Uh, many of the animals who live with us have disabilities, like Percy here, a rooster who has one leg. Um, but again, our goal is to have these animals have he happy and healthy lives, and sometimes uh, that means we create a separate accommodation for them, and other times, you know, we they are able to just thrive on their own. So every animal has a name, and um, we recognize as an individual. And that's my husband, Paul, with Benny, one of our cow residents. Um, connecting people with these animals is a big part of what we do. Um, and that often involves a series of unlearning what we have heard about farm animals. 
because as it turns out, um, most of what we know about these animals is wrong, um, or we just don't really know very much about them at all. And so we love an opportunity for people to come and ask questions. We say there's no silly questions at the refuge, and really connect and understand who they are as individuals. And so today I'd like to tell you a few of the stories of where animals come from in an attempt to help you connect with them, even though they can't be here with us today. Um, so the first I story... Asked. Yeah. <laughs> the first story I want to tell is that of uh, a goat named Sweet Mama. Now, um, Sweet Mama was living in Western North Carolina on a dairy farm. And so every year she was being impregnated and then she was giving birth and then the babies were taken away. And that was happening year after year after year. And after about seven years, which is average, her body started to break down. Uh, after just being constantly impregnated and being milked, she couldn't produce that level of milk anymore. And so she was sent to the slaughter auction. And that would have been the end of her story, as it is for most. But not for Sweet Mama. As we learned getting to know her, she was a fighter and had a huge personality. And she actually escaped by jumping two sets of fences, running across a highway, where she was found by some cows. <laughs> and you can see in this image, Sweet Mama in the middle, and some very confused cows wondering what's wrong with that cow. Um, but she was also found by a kind woman who was coming to this farm to feed a colony of feral cats. And she's took pity on Sweet Mama, because there's this poor goat, she was very thin, she had a lot of trouble walking, and so she said, well, I'm going to bring food for you too. And so every day she would show up for food for the cats and food for Sweet Mama. Well, about two weeks into this, she arrived to find Sweet Mama in the middle of giving birth to not one, but two kids who came to be known as Ace and Ivy. And so at that time, this little family of three needed a safe place to go. And so they came to the refuge as our first goat residence. And it was very special because it was for Sweet Mama the first time that she was able to nurse and raise and keep her kids. And she lived with us for a couple of years until she passed away from a goat disease that's common in the dairy industry. But Ace and Ivy are her legacy and they live with us to this day. And when she escaped, from that farm, she not only saved her life, but she saved the lives of her kids. So she's one of my personal heroes. And the other story I want to tell you is about a little chicken named Hope. And Hope's story starts when uh, she's in a truck and she's going down the highway and she's on her way to slaughter. But somehow she falls or jumps out of this truck and a woman is driving one morning and sees off to her side a little pile of white feathers. And when she pulls over and stops, she finds that it's a little chicken. And so she scoops her up off the pavement, puts her in her car and drives her to us. And when they came in the driveway and I saw Hope, uh, I told this woman something I very rarely say. I said, I don't know if she's going to make it, but we're going to do everything we can to try. Because little Hope couldn't raise her head or open her eyes. Half her head was twice the size of what it should be from the trauma of the accident. And so we rushed her to the vet and they gave her medication. They said, well, now we're just going to have to wait and see what happens. And so we took her home. and. And she couldn't do much as her body was healing, so we had to tube feed her and give her fluids under the skin for about two weeks. And slowly and surely, we started to see signs of life from this little bird. First, she started to open one eye and look at us, and then she would close it again. And then she would open the other eye. And she, I remember... She took her first bite of food, which was some canned pumpkin. All of us were celebrating. We knew she was on the road to recovery and she was going to make it. And so finally, it was time for Hope to go out and be with other chickens and be outside. And when she did, it was the first time that she saw grass. 
And it was the first time that she felt the earth between her toes and felt the sun and was able to scratch and dig and do all those things that chickens love to do. Because birds like Hope live in the factory farm industry where they're inside and they never get to be out and experience nature and do all of those natural behaviors. So this is why we do the work that we do, because you know nobody likes the factory farming system. Nobody wants animals to be harmed and suffering like this. But yet, we go to the grocery store and we buy products that support that and support those industries. So in our society, we have a disconnect between our values and our actions. And I hope that that's something that everyone can, continues to think about, ultimately with the goal of making a kinder world for everybody. So if you like the work that we're doing, uh, if you could go back one, uh, you can support us uh, in multiple ways. Uh, you can sponsor an animal. Uh, on our website, all of our individual animals are listed with their names, and when you sponsor them, you get their portrait and a little rescue story sent to you. Uh, you can also volunteer with us in many different ways. We have volunteer opportunities seven days a week. Um, and then you can also uh, come out and visit. So we have monthly tours events where you can come and meet our animals, hear their stories. Uh, the next one is Saturday, July 27th. We'll have a couple of food trucks out there. And uh, you can learn all of that information on our website, which is there. And there's also some pamphlets and information at a table out front. And I just really appreciate the time for me to come and speak to you about our work. And uh, I thank you for inviting me.